Can you lawfully use your motorcycle helmet as a defensive weapon? How about if it's against a driver in oncoming traffic who just almost killed you? Join us and take a look at a video where exactly that happened. Hey folks, attorney Andrew Branca here for the Law of Self-Defense, where we teach you how to be hard to kill and hard to convict. As a motorcyclist myself, I'm certainly sensitive to the dangers presented by inattentive or even outright hostile cars while I'm out riding around. If the contact fight is between a car or truck on the one hand and a motorcycle on the other, the motorcycle is going to lose 10 times out of 10. It's critical when riding to be hyper-attentive to the dangerous larger motor vehicle traffic all around you, meaning really all the motor vehicle traffic around you. Often the danger is just from drivers being inattentive, they're glancing at their phones, or they suddenly realize they're about to miss their exit, or, or maybe they're drunk or otherwise under the influence. Or perhaps they're just terrible drivers. Even worse, of course, are the outright hostile drivers. Some drivers just hate motorcyclists. In some cases, not without some reason. Some riders can be real jerks. But then they take things a step too far when they try to use their larger vehicles to threaten or actually cause a rider's serious bodily injury or even death. Whether the driver is merely inattentive or actually threatening, no rider is going to like it very much when a larger vehicle comes close to taking their life. The question then becomes, under what circumstances that nearly killed rider can use force in response to that near-death threat? And that's exactly what we're covering today. We have a video here of a pickup truck driver deep into the oncoming lane occupied by the motorcyclist on whose helmet the camera filming this is mounted. Not only that, but the truck has crossed over a double yellow line, which in the U.S. at least means that crossing over lanes is completely prohibited even for passing purposes. So let's take a look at the first portion of this video here. I'll make myself smaller so we can see it better, and we'll go through this video in chunks. That was pretty close. Let me play that again because it goes so quick. This pickup truck is in the wrong lane in the U.S. It should be all the way to the left side of your screen. Instead, it's in the lane that belongs to this motorcyclist whose shadow we can just see here on the right. So that definitely is not good. Uh, so with perhaps three quarters of his lane taken up by the oncoming pickup truck and the speeding truck missing the motorcycle by just inches, it's understandable that the rider here would be upset. Again, as a rider myself, I'd be pretty darned upset. But then the rider does something I'd be very unlikely to do, and that is he turns his bike around with the apparent intent of chasing the pickup truck down. Going here, making a U turn, he's going after that pickup truck. Now, I say that's not something I'd likely do myself because I don't see any purpose to it. Nothing I do or say is likely to change that pickup truck driver's behavior. If the driver decides to keep going, I'm not going to waste time chasing him down for little gain. I certainly can't compel a pickup truck to stop from the back of my motorcycle. And if I do somehow have the opportunity to engage with the driver outside of his truck, what then? I'm in a fight? For what purpose? Remember, the moment you get engaged in a physical confrontation, you've just incurred two risks you were not incurring a moment before. A greater than zero risk of dying in that fight, because you don't know how the fight's going to go. There's no magic pixie dust that says the good guy wins the fight. And a greater than zero risk of going to prison for much of the rest of your life, even should you win the fight. There are circumstances in life worth those risks, death and prison, but is the errant driver who is not, whether through luck or divine providence, actually caused physical harm, one of those limited set of circumstances? Now, I don't tell other people what to do. Ride your own ride. You want to chase down that vehicle? That's your call to make, I suppose. But I'd be unlikely to turn around and chase down this pickup myself. Back to the video here. So the pickup truck driver actually backed up and came back to where the motorcyclist was. So it's a, now it's a meeting engagement. 
So almost as soon as the motorcyclist here turns around his bike to pursue the pickup, we see the pickup is already backing up in reverse towards the motorcyclist. And we see the woman here in the passenger seat start talking to the motorcyclist through her open window. And the male driver of the pickup comes around the front of the vehicle to approach the rider. And the rider sees an opportunity here to give these two a piece of his mind and a heated verbal exchange not entirely coherent starts between the driver and the rider. Um, pretty close with the two men at bad breath distance. Let's watch a bit of that. Hey, hell no, you ain't gonna tell me shit. Look, I got kids in my mother Did you see what the fuck you just I said to care. me? I got I that don't shit care. on goddamn camera. I don't care. By the way, if you note the completely uncooperative and apparently low intelligence presentation of the pickup truck driver here, you'll see why I'm generally disinclined to bother chasing such people down. There's no point trying to pour sense into a bucket with no bottom. It's at this point, however, that things get physically violent, not from the pickup driver and not even from the rider who's engaged with the pickup driver, but from a second motorcyclist who is presumably accompanying the first rider but it only gets captured on the video now. That second rider rushes up from behind the pickup truck driver and forcefully drives the helmet on his head into the skull of the pickup truck driver. This forces the driver back and actually down onto the shoulder of the roadway. Here is that. I don't care. No, bullshit. I don't care. Bullshit. I don't care. I don't care. Now, we can't really see what's happening between the driver and the first motorcyclist at this moment. In fact, I'll rewind it a bit so we can see the shouting again. And of course, the, the camera of this motorcyclist is mounted to the side of his helmet, if you can't tell. So that's how that's how close these two men are. I don't, I don't care. Goddamn camera. I don't care. No, bullshit. I don't care. Bullshit. I don't care. I don't <laughs> so we can't really see what's going on between the first rider with the camera mounted on his helmet and the pickup truck driver. Um, but the legal question for us is, are there circumstances under which this helmet blow from the second rider could be a lawful use of force in defense of the first rider, a defense of others situation? Now, it wouldn't be a straight up self-defense situation because the second rider was not himself being engaged by the pickup truck driver, defense of others which is just a form of defensive persons. Defensive persons include self-defense and defense of others. The legal answer to that legal question, could this helmet strike have been lawful defense of others, is, of course, maybe. It depends on some specific facts that the video does not disclose to us. But knowing what facts matter in the proper legal context can certainly help guide us to the correct legal questions and the correct legal answer. So I propose to take a look at precisely that. You probably all know by now that there are up to five elements of a claim of self-defense. And if the prosecution can disprove any one of those required elements, your claim of self-defense, or in this case, defense of others, collapses. Those five elements, the building blocks of any claim of defense of persons, a legal justification for the use of force against another. In defense of persons, those five elements are innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. And we're going to dive into each of those in the context of this video. Now, if you're not familiar with these five elements of defense of persons, uh, that's too bad. Because if you don't know these, you can't possibly know when it's lawful for you to defend yourself, your family, or your property. But no worries. In a couple of minutes, I'll share with you how you can get a world-class education on these elements for free. Just stick with me to the end of this video. For now, let's work through those five elements. Innocence. So generally speaking, you can act in defense of an innocent person being subject to unlawful physical aggression. To the same extent, the person you're protecting would have been privileged to act in self-defense. So the second rider here can use force to defend the first rider to the same extent that the first rider was an innocent victim of unlawful physical aggression who would have been privileged to use that same force in his own self-defense. So if the first rider would have been privileged to strike the pickup truck driver with his own helmet, well, then the second rider is privileged to strike the pickup truck driver with his helmet in defense of the first rider. The legal question for innocence then is, was the first rider being subject to some initial unlawful force 
or threat of force that would have justified his own self-defense. We can't really tell from the videotape. But what I'd want to see in this case would be the pickup driver doing something like putting hands on the first rider or, or about to put hands on. More on that in a moment. So that's the first of the five elements, innocence. Let's take a look now at imminence. Generally speaking, you can use force in defense against unlawful aggression that is either actually occurring, it's already happening, or importantly, it's immediately about to occur. So the second rider wouldn't need to wait for the pickup driver to literally go hands-on with the first rider if it was apparent that the pickup truck driver was about to go hands-on. The threat defended against can, can't be in the past and over already, and it can't be in the future and speculative, but it doesn't need to be actually occurring if it's imminently about to occur. An imminent threat is sufficient to justify the use of defensive force. So the legal question for imminence then is whether the first rider was either actually being or was about to be subject to the unlawful physical aggression that we've already discussed. The third element is proportionality. So you can generally only use deadly force in self-defense against a deadly force threat. Otherwise, you're limited to using only non-deadly force in self-defense against what's presumably a non-deadly force threat. Now, importantly, this means that the degree of aggressive force, the other guy's intensity of force, determines the permissible degree of your defensive force. The legal question for proportionality then is first whether the head strike with the helmet would qualify as deadly force or is the helmet strike only non-deadly force? If the head strike with the helmet would qualify as force likely to inflict death or serious bodily injury, then it would qualify as deadly force. That's the definition of deadly force and would be lawful only if the threat being defended against was also deadly in nature. That is, that the first rider was, in the moment the helmet strike occurred, being subject to a deadly force threat, something more than bad breath or shove, or imminently about to be subject to a deadly force threat. If, on the other hand, the helmet strike would not be likely to cause death or serious bodily injury, it would qualify as only non-deadly force. And in that case, it would be justified even if the first rider was facing merely a non-deadly threat of force from the pickup truck driver such as just a shove. Here, it does not appear that the helmet strike caused much real harm. Uh, the man who was knocked down gets right up again. In fact, let's watch a, a little more of that video so we can see that. The pickup truck driver just got knocked down to the ground. I'll rewind a little bit so we can see that blow again and see him get right back up again. He doesn't seem particularly injured. Oh, hey. So, doesn't seem like much serious physical injury occurred here. So, I'd be inclined to call this helmet strike here, in this particular context, on the particular facts of this case, mere non-deadly force. Of course, a more vigorous strike could have had far different and more serious results. The next element is avoidance. In about 80% of states, there's no generalized legal duty to retreat before you can act in otherwise lawful self-defense. By extension, there's no generalized legal duty to retreat before you can act in defense of another person. Even in the 20% of states that do impose a generalized legal duty to retreat, you're not required to leave behind someone to be the victim of an unlawful attack, even if you could have safely retreated if the other person would be unable to do so. Now, this element gets a bit sketchy on the facts shown in this video, and it might take some witness statements or other evidence to get clarity on this question of retreat. If this confrontation did occur in one of the 11 duty to retreat states, the final element of a claim of defense of others is reasonableness. And this requires both that the person using purportedly defensive force, had a genuine good faith belief in the need to use that force, and that a hypothetical, reasonable, and prudent person would have shared that belief. Now, a big part of this element is that it is not necessary that the person using defensive force be correct in their assessment of the situation. It's only necessary that their perception of the need to act in defense of others was a reasonable perception, 
even if mistaken. Mistakes are allowed in defense of others if they are reasonable mistakes. And again, this element gets a bit sketchy on the facts shown in this video. It might take some witness statements or other evidence to get clarity on this question. So based on the limited evidence we have to work with, it's hard to come to a firm conclusion on whether this helmet strike may have been lawful defense of others or, on the other hand, an unlawful battery carrying criminal sanction. What we've learned, however, is the proper legal questions. And of course, without those, we would never have any possibility of arriving at the correct legal answers. Now, I've mentioned earlier that I'd share with you how you can get a free education on the five elements of self-defense and thereby make yourself hard to convict if you're ever compelled to use force in defense of yourself, your family, your property. Here's where I come through with that promise. Right now, you can grab your 100% free copy of our five elements of self-defense law cheat sheet. It lists the five elements of self-defense and provides a brief description of each. We don't charge a penny for this. It's 100% free, and you can download your own copy of that cheat sheet at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. Elements for the five elements of self-defense, lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. And for those of you interested in a much more in-depth and much more actionable understanding of the legal boundaries for the use of force in defense of yourself, your family, and your property, you can right now grab your free copy of our best-selling book, The Law of Self-Defense Principles, Our Gift to You. Now, you can check out The Law of Self-Defense Principles on Amazon if you like. It's five-star rated, but don't buy it on Amazon. They'll charge you for the book and the shipping and handling. We only ask you to cover the cost of shipping the book to you. The book itself, we give you for free. Grab your free copy of The Law of Self-Defense Principles at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. Now, until we meet again, I'll just remind all of you that if you carry a gun so that you're hard to kill or carry a knife or study jujitsu or carry pepper spray, whatever you do, so you're hard to kill, so your family is hard to kill, if you do any of that, and I do all of that, so my own family is hard to kill, so I'm hard to kill. If you do any of that, you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict as well. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for the Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.